He is a great God. I keep thinking when we say things like that, it's such an understatement. Can't imagine just how great He is. But the thing that I love is as great as He is in creating the universe, His love for us is even greater. And that's wonderful. I'm going to start with our scripture today. Read it. We're in Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. It'll be on the screen. We got Bibles in the pews there that you can read. Reading Hebrews chapter 9, uh, 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain which is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with poor, pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Join me in prayer. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We find wisdom in your word. We find comfort. We find knowledge. We find strength. And Lord, just your word as I read it just brings peace and calm to my soul. Father, I pray that you would open hearts and minds today as we look into your word and see what you have to share with us. Thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As we look at these scriptures, I think some background help would help. It says, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence. Well, what do we have confidence in? The author of Hebrews and the chapters before that is, has laid that groundwork. But rather than read nine other chapters, I'll give you a, kind of a synopsis. He's talking, he's really been divulging and talking about the temple and temple worship in the tabernacle that all the Jews, this was written to the Hebrews, all the Jews were familiar with. And so he's springboarding, the author is, off what they knew and talking about the new confidence we have in Jesus Christ. And so in looking at that, I want to show you the temple. I have a diagram up here of what that temple was. And this was started with the Mosaic law. Moses gave them this instruction and they would break down this tabernacle, it was kind of called, later when it became a permanent structure, it changed to temple. These were all tents that they would tear down, move to their new location because they're wandering in the wilderness. They would rebuild it and then they would use it to worship and everything in it had meaning. This section all around here was called the outer courtyard and that's where the average person would come in order to be in the tabernacle and worship and, and it's the only area that a non-Jewish, a non-Israelite was allowed to come. They weren't allowed in other sections but they could hear and there's different things here that they use in the worship. Then we have another section called the Holy Place and only the priests were allowed in there. And there were 12 tribes of Israel, you remember that, and each one, of course, had priests. And the priests would go into this area, the, the holy place, and they would do offerings and sacrifices for the people to cover for their sin and to uh, help them be righteous through the sacrifices before God. Then finally up here, which is what concerns us the most, is the most holy place, and that was to embody the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant, if you watch Raiders of the Lost Ark, you remember the Ark of the Covenant? That stayed in there and that symbolized the presence of God Almighty and no one was allowed in there because 
no one could go into the presence of God because of the sin in their lives. Once a year, the high priest of all the priests would go in to make uh, offering and sacrifices for the people. And it was so sacred that only he could go in that they would actually tie a rope around his ankle so that if he should die for some reason or become incapacitated where he couldn't walk out, they would pull him out because they weren't even to go in to get him. So that's how sacred this place was. And he would go in to this area here once a year and make sacrifice for the people so that they, they had that righteousness before God and their sin was not completely erased, but it was covered over. And he would take a lamb and sacrifice it or another animal and he would take a, called a hyssop, a branch of that and dip it in the blood and he would sprinkle all of this in here. And Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. All of this is a picture, a foreshadowing of what was occurring and what the heavenly realm is like. This is all a picture of, of uh, worship and uh, it, it doesn't relate exactly because heaven is an is a ethereal kind of place, but this is a physical representation. And that blood was a foreshadowing, a picture of what needed to happen. And so that's what the author here is talking about, is that things have occurred with Jesus Christ coming that changed and that made it possible for us to go into. We have a confidence of entering into God. One of the wonderful things, I need the diagram back up, is this veil here was a very heavy curtain, a very ornate, heavy curtain that was there to separate the two sections. And, and it kept people from seeing in. They, uh, weren't, they could have gone through, but they weren't to go through. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, took our sins upon himself, and when he died, Matthew 27, 51 tells us that the, temp, the curtain in the temple at the time, which was now a permanent structure, was rent from top to bottom. And that's very, very uh, important to understand because if a man had gone in and grabbed a curtain, if I were to grab this here behind me and tear it, I'd start at the bottom and I'd rip it out this way. But it starting at the top and being torn down gives us that picture of God removing that veil, removing that barrier between him and us. And that's what happened when Jesus Christ died on the cross. He took those sins upon us. So we have this symbolism here in, in Hebrews that the author is talking about to share with us what happened. And he's talking about since that veil was rent, since it's not there anymore, we now have passage into God. We have a confidence we can go in to have fellowship with Him to have a relationship with him. That wasn't possible in the Old Testament. God cannot abide where sin is. And man, can, man sinful, cannot go into the presence of God. It would be instant death if, they, if a man did do that. Man cannot look on God. He's too holy. He's too perfect. But because Jesus Christ came took the sin we have upon us, upon himself. He, he had no sin. He was a perfect God-man. And that's the only way. You see, a perfect man had to die for the sins of mankind. But no man can be perfect. Try as we may, we can't do everything right. I, I try to live a good life, but you know what? I still have to have that morning quiet time or evening time on my bed. Say, God, I'm sorry, I messed up again. Did it again, Lord. Even the great apostle Paul 
shared. He said, that which I want to do, I, I, I don't do, and that which I don't want to do, I do. What a, what a messed up man I am. And we all have that. We have that sin nature that drives us to pursue self, to look out for self. And so it keeps us from being perfect before God. And God says the only way into my inner sanctum, into my heaven, is to be perfect, without sin, without blemish. And that that all points back to in the Old Testament why it was an unblemished animal, lamb, calf, that was to be brought before God. Perfect. That's why it was to be the first of the flock. All of this is foreshadowing Jesus Christ, the perfect God-man who was without sin, and it took God come into the flesh in order to be perfect. And Jesus was that person. And so he, as that perfect God-man, took our sinful nature upon himself. And the thing that blows my mind, and it, as I, especially as I read, I love Hebrews. I've read it time and time again and can't get enough of it because of the depth there. But it blows my mind as I think about Jesus when he was on the cross. All those people that lived before couldn't come into God's presence because of their unrighteousness. And it's more than we can go into today. But back before Jesus Christ, when someone died, they went to Sheol, the place of the dead. It was kind of a holding pattern until a later time. They were waiting. They were captives, Paul talks about them. They're all in that Sheol, the righteous and the unrighteous. But the righteous, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, all those righteous people that believed in God and tried to live according to Him and His ways Christ died for, took their sins upon himself, had to be millions of people. All of the people alive at that time of Jesus Christ, Christ took their sins upon himself. Then everybody, including you and me, that was ever going to live, Jesus Christ took our sins upon himself. Is it any wonder as he was on the cross that he felt such agony? He had the physical agony of them driving spikes through his wrist and that's where they put them so the bones would hold him up. They put spikes through his feet. That hurt, certainly. As the people were on the cross... They typically died from suffocation because as they hung by their arms, their body would weigh them down. And if your whole body's pulling, your trachea gets cut off and you can't breathe. And in a meanness, almost a seeming kindness, the Roman soldiers would put a little little pedestal on the bottom of that cross and that's what they'd nail the feet to. And what that allowed because they'd be crouched just to push themselves up, get a breath of air, and then in fatigue they'd shrink back down. And what that actually did was prolong their suffering on the cross because that, that instinct we have to live would push us up to get a breath. And it was only after we were so fatigued. And sometimes they would come around and mercifully put a spear in them so that they would die. But in the process of that up and down, their their naked back would rub against the wood and rub their back raw if they hadn't already been whipped. Horrible, horrible death. But that wasn't the biggest agony. The biggest agony was this man, God-man, Jesus Christ, who was perfect, carrying, taking on himself, the sins from Adam and to whoever the last man and woman is upon himself. And I believe that's why when, when he had that on him, that the heavenly father could not look down upon his son because his son had sin upon him. 
And Jesus felt that agony. He felt that being forsaken. And he cries out on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That separation from God because of our sins upon him. But as God-man, he was able to take that sin to the grave. And unlike us who can die with sin, Jesus could leave it there. He left your sins there. He paid for them. He paid the price. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. His blood was shed. And Paul talks about in his scripture that then all of those I told you who had lived before, who had been waiting in Sheol, the righteous, not the unrighteous, it says Jesus led captives in his train. Those who had waited thousands of years were finally able to be resurrected and go to be in heaven with their father that they loved. They were freed. He set the captives free. He's ready to set each one of us free. He's ready. He's done that work for us. God has already done it. And so we have Jesus as that final high priest. You see, in the Old Testament of the Mosaic Law, those priests were not perfect. The high priest that went in there, he had to go through special rituals, special cleansing, to be able to momentarily go into the Holy of Holies or the Most Holy Place, it's also called. And they, he was a man. So that priest would pass away and another priest would go in and year after year that act was done. But Jesus Christ, because He's eternal, because He was God, did that work once and for all. And He is a high priest forever. And by His work in that position, He was the last and final high priest. He's God. And we talk about that, and, and, and the Bible talks about that since that happened, and Jesus predicted it when he was getting ready to leave, he said, I've got to go. He knew what was going on. He tried to tell his disciples about it. They didn't want to hear it. But he said, unless I go, the Holy Spirit cannot come, the Comforter. But if I go, I will send him to be with you. And so the Holy Spirit comes. God is the Holy Spirit. That's that third part of the triune God, the person of the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ, comes and lives within us. And we effect become priest before God, each one of us. And while I am here, and you're welcome to sit down with me, and I'll be happy to take time, and we can talk about uh, concerns that you have about salvation or just life, you don't need to come to me and confess. Because you have that relationship with God, you can talk with Him directly. As Julie led the children to say, when we're scared, we can pray and talk to God. That's what Jesus did, and it was once and for all. Matter of fact, it turns out that if it wasn't once and for all, and if we don't really accept that, figuratively we're saying, Jesus, you got to get back on that cross. What you did wasn't complete, Jesus. You've got to do it again so I can be forgiven. And praise God, that isn't the case. He did it completely. He did it once and for all. And so that is why the author here says, since we have confidence to enter that most holy place, we have confidence because Jesus Christ has cleansed us of our sin and has made it possible. His cross became a bridge to God. And we can have confidence. You know, when, when I was a boy... And even as a man, sometimes I have to face my wife. If I know I've done something to displease my parents or my wife, I don't really want to talk to them. 
because I know they're going to be displeased with me. That's human nature. And that's where we are with God. If we know that we've got stuff in our life that he wouldn't be happy with, we don't have confidence to go in and see him. But because of Jesus' work, because that sin has been atoned for, because we are cleansed, we can go into his presence and have communion with that loving Father that stands at the head of the driveway watching for us to come. And so we go back to our verse. That's why we have confidence to enter that because a new and living way has been opened through for us through the curtain which has been now torn down. And we have this great priest, Jesus. And so he gives us these five encouragements of what we can do now. The first one is draw near to God. We don't need to be afraid to come into his presence. We have his love. We have his forgiveness. We have his reconciliation. And now I can commune with God my Father freely. He says, let us hold unswervingly to the blessed hope because Jesus was resurrected and went to heaven and is there at the right hand of the throne of the God interceding on my behalf. I know that when that day comes that I have my last breath and I believed in Jesus Christ as my Savior that I'm with him in heaven. I can hold on to that hope no matter how bad this old world seems, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how tough it is, I hold on to that hope of that day when I go to be with Him. And no more pain, no more war, no more sorrow. He also tells us to let us spend our lives challenging each other to follow His example of love. We can spend our time, instead of in conflict, encouraging each other to be Christ to other people. To share Christ with other people. Not only in our words, but more so in our life. Because people see what we live more than they hear what we say. We can say all kinds of things, but our life shows a different life. They recognize hypocrisy. And so we in here, we Christians, encourage each other to follow His love. Verse four, let our, number 4, let us come together regularly in worship. You know, we humans need, need to do things together. We know what to do to break some habit, to lose weight, to uh, whatever it is. But it helps if we're part of a group to encourage each other, to spur us on, to say, come on, you can do it. I know you fell, you ate a whole pizza. Let's go walking. See, we help each other that way. And we do that when we come into God's house. We encourage each other. We sing songs of the faith. We hear God's word. It helps us. That's why. And then finally, let us give each other encouragement. I need encouragement, don't you? It's a struggle out there day by day. There's challenges. There's illness that we face. And it helps me to be encouraged. And that's what you do for me. You encourage me. I've received encouragement today. I've received encouragement just from you being here. It's great. And all the people I know that have pitched in to help make today a wonderful day, that encourages me. And we want to encourage you. And it says, as we see his day, and if you'll notice in your scripture, that day is capitalized, approaching. There's coming a day when Jesus Christ is going to return. And when that is, and the Bible teaches us that no man knows the day or the hour, the angels don't know, only God the Father knows. But when that day comes, the Bible is, is so picturesque in it. It says a trumpet will sound and those who are already dead will rise first. Then we which are alive will be called up to meet him in the air. There's a day coming 
And part of that day is not only calling us home, but it's a day of judgment. When God comes to settle the score. So there's, it's saying let's encourage each other as we see His day approaching. You know, I've lived long enough. I've heard many people propose that the day's coming. I, I remember as a young man, uh, some of you will know the name that uh, um, it slipped me now. I want to say Spiro Agnew, but that's not Kissinger. That Kissinger was supposed to be the Antichrist. Person after person has been proposed as the Antichrist. We don't know. We've heard the stories and we can become jaded, but there is coming a day, God's Word is true, when it will be the final day. And many will come one day too late. Before Christ, we had no reason for hope. We were doomed. We were going to die in our sin. We had no rationale for encouragement. We were a people without a means to enter into a relationship with God because we did not have the power to be perfect. By His great mercy and His grace, His sacrificial act, God set aside the judgment we deserved and He gives us grace. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. He not only was merciful in setting aside our sentence, He extended grace to give us more than we deserve. But Christ did come. And He did do that work. And there's one more action to be taken. God's demonstrated His love for you by sending His Son to die in your stead. God took the initiative to provide a means for you to enter into His presence. God is a God of liberty. He doesn't force you to come to Him. He is the Almighty God. He can do it, and you're there. He could force it. But He doesn't. He makes the gift available. He bids you by His Holy Spirit, which uh, can be a still, small voice. It can be a mom or a dad, an aunt or an uncle, a preacher, anybody, a friend on the street. That says you ought to know my Jesus. He doesn't force you. He is that father of the prodigal son. Standing watching for your arrival. And when you arrive. He doesn't beat you up for all you've done. Like the prodigal father. He he says bring a robe to put on my son. He's returned. Get a ring to put on my daughter. She's returned. Throw a feast for my child has returned. He doesn't bother with recriminations. He's happy. Coming home though does mean realizing you've made bad choices. Realizing that your way is not the best way. It means you accept that His way is the right way. It's a change of will. Not my will, but thine be done, Father. Despite anything you've done, though, you don't need to fear His rejection. He will accept you. He does accept you. He wants you as part of His family. He's already forgiven you. You have but to claim it. He's cleansed you. He's prepared a place for you to be with Him. God who created the universe and all we know by the power of His voice could make you come. But you know, He restrains Himself because that's what He wants. It says, the Bible tells us, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to eternal life. He wants each and every one of us. And so it, it, it's got to be hard on Him as a father not to make it happen. But He loves that joy when you decide to come His way. Just like you as a parent enjoy the joy of your children coming to you and showing their love for you. He bids you through the person of this Holy Spirit. He sent His Son to make a way for you. 
Why on earth would any of us want to wander in the wilderness? Why would we want to struggle and make our own way? Because we have that selfish nature. But it makes no sense. We think we have freedom in making our own decisions. But really we're a slave to our human nature. We are a slave to that lust that drives us. Lust for money. Lust for other people. That drives us. There's true freedom in Jesus Christ and in God. He's standing there at the head of the driveway, watching, waiting, wanting you to come. Won't you decide to come home? If you've never made that decision, I invite you to today. None of us have any guarantee you've heard that before, and it's true. We might, we probably have tomorrow, but why wait? I'm here today, be happy to share with you, pray, open with you more about what the Father's done. You know, Christians, sometimes we may be more foolish because we've heard the voice, we've accepted what Jesus has done on our behalf. We know His goodness, we know His Word, and yet, We still try to do things our own way. We still go our own way. And we struggle. Won't we decide today to come home? You know, I said we humans need a place to belong. The scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. We need a group that encourages us, that spurs us on, that hugs us when we're down, hugs us when we're happy, shares our joys and sorrows, encourages us, picks us up, gives us help. Well, this family is here to welcome you. They're here to receive you. We aren't perfect. I put in here, they aren't perfect. I need to change that. We're not perfect. We fall. We stumble. But we worship a God who's already forgiven, already cleansed. I have but to acknowledge that before Him and and fellowship's restored. We want to extend that grace to you, that love, that family. And we'll let you down, but He doesn't. And we're pointing the way to him.